Hello Tourism 322 students, um, welcome to our alternative lecture format um, where I will be speaking to you and narrating over the slides for this week's content. What I'll be doing is a, a short review of content that we discussed last week, particularly as it relates to different types of variables and their scales. And then we'll go on to the more important content for this week which is applying some analysis of quantitative data using descriptive statistics. So let's begin. So our analysis of quantitative data is going to use this example of tourist arrivals as we've discussed before. And as before, we're going to follow the research process, this five-step process where we first identify a problem, then we formulate a very clear research question that is focused on that problem, then we develop methods for sampling, collecting and analyzing that data, in this case quantitative data using descriptive statistics as our means of analysis, we'll draw conclusions from that data, and then perhaps most importantly we're going to share our findings because if we do research and don't share it with anyone, it's really just for our own benefit. And what I'll show is that some of the outputs of research from tourism can actually be very transformative in society. So just to review, when we're looking at analyzing anything, whether it be qualitative or quantitative data, we need to make sense of that data. So in the case of quantitative data, the raw data is going to be numerical. It's going to be numerical variables with different scales. There were two particular types of variables that we've discussed before. Discrete variables that come from a limited range of possibilities, such as gender, nationality, perhaps even occupation. And then there are continuous variables a virtually unlimited range of possibilities, including age, although we don't live forever, income, and we certainly don't have unlimited incomes, and what we'll use most productively here in this case are numbers of tourist arrivals. So the next step we'll do is apply some analytical strategies to that data, in this case using statistical analysis, and out of that, we'll get a logical description and an explanation of the phenomena that we're actually trying to study. So, what's the problem? Well, what we do know is that South Africa's new immigration policies may be having an effect on tourism. Those policies where they regard tourists who have with them children under 18 years of age. From that problem, we can formulate a research question. And in this case, we'll look at the characteristics of international tourist arrivals from South Africa and how the new immigration legislation might impact their experience. What kind of data are we going to use? Well, in this case, we're going to use a structured survey or a questionnaire. And we're going to give that to arriving passengers at Cape Town International Airport. And what we're going to do is analyze that data. We're going to look at data, different types of variables, at different scales. And we're going to make sense of it through descriptive statistics. So a very brief review of quantitative data itself. Quantitative data are numerical. They're numbers but we can get quantitative data from a number of different research strategies. Even through what we might think of as traditionally qualitative approaches, such as interviews, we could get numerical data that emerge from that. But typically, we get quantitative data from surveys and experiments. And of course, that data comes on a variety of scales. Of course, quantitative data, just like qualitative, 
needs to be organized and coded before we can analyze it. So we do the same with quantitative. We organize it, we code it, and in this case, for quantitative data, we enter it for statistical analysis in software packages such as Microsoft Excel or SPSS, which is a very powerful statistical analysis software. So in terms of the nominal scale, as we've discussed before, nominal scale really just indicates characteristics of objects or individuals. The name actually comes from the word named. Nominal meaning the named description of a characteristic, such as nationality, such as occupation. The second, the ordinal or rank scale, is used most often um, to identify categories according to some preference, best to worst, highest to lowest, ratings of quality, ratings of agreement. The interval scale is related to the previous, to the ordinal. But what differentiates the interval from the ordinal is that the distances between the points on the scale are the same. So think of degrees. Each point in between those data points is the same interval. And then finally, there's the ratio scale. This is seen as the most powerful of the scales um, because it has a, each of those points of data on the ratio scale have a unique zero origin. So we can talk about age, you could talk about weight, you could talk about the number of tourist arrivals. They all start with, at a zero origin and then go potentially to infinity. So we can do mathematical calculations on those because of that. Altine and Paraskevas, the authors from which this material comes, very clearly lay out the different characteristics and, the, and some examples of these different kinds of scales of quantitative data. So I'd urge you to take a look at this table closely and of course refer back to the reading that discusses it in more detail. What's important here on this particular slide is to look at the interval scale. One of the examples they give is of the interval scale is an attitude survey that measures a variable based on a point, like a five point, a seven point scale. We call this a Likert scale. This is very often used in tourism research, particularly when measuring quality, when measuring preference, when measuring um, attitudes. So back to our original discussion of how we're going to analyze this data. We've got our question, and now we've got some data, at least a plan, to collect the data using our structured survey. You might want to find more out about the numbers of arrivals, the nationality, how many of them arrived with children, how many arrived unaccompanied, their satisfaction with their arrivals experience, any difficulties that they experienced in arrivals, and the importance of that experience in their future plans to visit South Africa. We could incorporate all of these different types of questions and the variables at their scales in our survey. But of course, before we do that, before we analyze it, we'd have to organize that data, we'd have to code it, and we'd have to enter it most likely in a software package to make sense of it. Now, how would we do that? Well, what we would do is we would use descriptive statistics in order to analyze our quantitative data. We're only going to use a very simple form of statistical analysis, the most basic, which is descriptive. It describes the data in question. So in this image, taken also from Elton and Paraskevas, we see the different scales of measurement of data, 
and then how we might measure central tendency, where that data fits along the range of our data that we've collected, and then dispersion, how that data deviates or varies from what is typical. Let's talk about this in more depth. So descriptive statistics describe the numbers. There are a number of ways we can describe our data. We might look at the minimum. Minimum, as the name implies, is the minimum value of your data set. So if you have a range of data that emerges and the lowest value is one, then your minimum is one. Similarly, the maximum, that's the maximum value in your data set. So in a calculation of tourist arrivals over the past 10 years, it would be that point of value that is the highest. The median. The median is the middle piece of data. Think of the median in a road, in a divided roadway, that little strip of grass in between the lanes of traffic. That's the middle. So the median of your data is the middle piece of data once you've sorted the data from the largest to the smallest, or smallest to largest. Then there's the mean. We've all probably calculated the mean or average of a set of data. This is done very simply by adding the sum of all the values and dividing it by the number of points of data. Then, of course, we want to look at dispersion, also a form of descriptive statistics, either standard deviation or variance. Now, we won't be using this very much in our examples, but it's important to understand that to understand how a, point, a particular point of data deviates from the norm or varies from the norm can be quite important and useful. And then there's correlation. Correlation is a very powerful analytical tool to look at relationships between variables. We can use a very simple correlation function in Microsoft Excel using the command corel, C-O-R-R-E-L, and applying it to two different fields or columns of data. A correlation test allows us to test the strength of the relationship between variables. And the coefficient or the relationship that emerges from that will always be a value between negative one and positive one. So for example, if we have a coefficient of positive one, that indicates that the two variables in question are perfectly and positively correlated, meaning as one variable increases, so does the value of the other, all the time. On the other hand, a coefficient of negative one will indicate a precise negative relationship, so that when one var variable increases, the other will decrease. And then there's a zero. A zero coefficient indicates there's no relationship at all that as one goes up or down, the other isn't affected. Let's look at an example of this. In this very simple spreadsheet, we see three columns. In the first column are years. Now, the example I'm gonna give here would be, let's say, tourist arrivals in South Africa between 1994 and 2006. So the second column would be the number of arrivals, the absolute number of arrivals in that particular year. And then the third and final column is the poverty index. Poverty index would be a measurement of poverty in the society in question. So an index of one would indicate that the entire population is impoverished, whereas an index of zero would in indicate the absence of poverty. Now, of course, wouldn't we want that to be the case in South Africa? What we might find out is that 
tourism might have a role in affecting poverty. And we can measure that by looking at the relationship between tourist arrivals in column two with that of poverty index in column three. We would apply a very simple correlation calculation between the arrivals column and the poverty index column. And what we would find in this example is that there's a very strong negative correlation that emerges. The negative correlation means that as arrivals increase, the poverty index decreases. That actually is a very strong argument for the transformative power of tourism to actually affect poverty, which is one of the reasons that tourism is such an important um, element of economic and social development in South Africa. Okay, let's return to our example in the arrival survey. And let's look at a possible structure of a very simple arrival survey that we might apply to international arrivals at Cape Town International Airport. You'll see in this very simple survey de device, we ask four questions. And those are seen in the first column. What's your nationality? What is the purpose of your stay? How many days do you intend staying? And how would you rate your arrivals experience at immigration? We give various options for all of those questions. But what we need to look at is what kinds of variable, what types of variable or data are we looking at here and on which scales? How might we code them and how might we analyze them? So let's look first at the type of variable and the data that's involved here with these questions. Let's look at the first one. What is your nationality? Well, the options are very much discrete variables. There's only a certain number of possibilities. You could be South African, British, German, or any other nationality. But it's not an infinite number of nationalities. It's limited to the nation states on Earth. So it's a discrete variable, and it's at a nominal scale. The second question, what is the purpose of your stay? That's also a discrete variable, because there are only a certain number of possibilities here. Business or work, holiday, or transit. We've only provided three opportunities or three different possibilities for our respondents to answer. It's still a discrete variable and it's also at the nominal scale. Our third question, how many days do you intend staying? Well, that's virtually unlimited here. So it's a continuous variable, and it's at a ratio scale because it has a unique zero origin. And then our final question, how do you rate your arrival experience and immigration? Mm -hmm. We've also given just a few options for our respondents to answer. So that's a discrete variable. And that's at an interval scale. Mm -hmm. Because each of those points are at the same intervals. So if we understand the types of variables and the scales, let's then move on to how we might code this particular data. Now we can see our original survey, but you'll see in red some numbers. Those numbers are codes. So what we've done here is we've just assigned numbers to the possible answers that our respondents will give. There's one exception here though. In our third question, how many days did you intend staying? We didn't code it because there's an infinite number of possibilities. Now, the reason we apply codes is that we can take that data and, for example, we can look at averages, we can look at minimum numbers, maximum numbers, means, modes, medians. We've now taken answers which started out as text 
and we've applied numbers to them in the form of codes that will then be analyzed using descriptive statistics. So how will we analyze this? Well, let's take an example here of the responses. So this would be an example of data that emerges from a, res from a set of responses from 10 different arrivals. So here's the data. In the first column, respondent number 1 through 10. In the second column, their nationality coded according to our coding scheme that I saw previously. You see we asked them the nationality, so 1 equals South African, 2 equals British, 3 German, 4 Dutch, 5 American, and 6 other, which essentially covers all the other nations of the world. Third column, their purpose, also coded according to our scheme. So the purpose could be business or work, which was coded as a 1, Holiday, which we'd code as a 2, Transit, we'd code as a 3, and Residence, which we might code as a 4. So there we have those results as well. Then we have, in the fourth column, their stay. Now remember, this is ratio data, and we also allowed our respondents to fill in that number. You'll see a very wide range of responses from one day all the way up to 365, which is kind of curious. We'll talk more about that just now. And then finally, in the fifth column, the arrival experience. Now you remember we asked them to rate their arrival experience from one, equaling very poor, all the way up to five, equaling very good. So there's a range of responses. Now you might wonder, what are we going to do with that? Well, firstly, we have got to clean it up. We've coded. We might have to clean it up. What do we mean by that? Well, look at this. In the fourth column, we had a respondent who's respondent number seven, whose nationality was coded as one. So what we know already is that that's a South African. What we also know is the purpose of their stay was residence. So they were coming back home and they filled in their stay as 365, a full year. Now that's potentially problematic to our analysis. Why? Because it's going to skew our data. Most of our respondents, as you can see, have quite short stays, ranging from one day to 30 days. Once we add the respondent number seven, 365 days, Imagine what that's going to do to our average. It's going to bring the average up very high, in fact, abnormally high, and that will skew our results. So we do have to clean that up. We might, in fact, eliminate respondent number seven from our study. So let's take another look at how we might use this data in our analysis. We could actually analyze the most prevalent nationality. In other words, the mode of a nominal variable. So the mode, the most prevalent nationality amongst our respondents, is two. Two, you may remember, was the nationality British. So now we can say something about our respondents. The most prevalent purpose, also a mode, remember mode being the variable that appears most often in your data set, is also a two. And if we remind ourselves, that purpose is holiday, coded as two. Their average stay, which is the mean, is 45 days. The average day in days adjusted is 9.44. Now you see the difference between 
including respondent number seven in our study, or excluding respondent number seven when we cleaned up the data. Respondent number seven skewed our results. It's much more useful to consider the average stay of tourists, non-residents, as just over nine days. That's a very different result than 45 days. So that speaks to the importance of cleaning up the data and sometimes excluding respondents where it needs to be. The median stay in day, in, in the number of days, meaning the middle variable once we assigned and organized our data, is seven days. And the arrival experience of our sample set is a 3.6. That's the mean of that particular interval variable. Now, a 3.6, how does that translate to arrival experience? Well, look at question number four. A 3.6 would take us somewhere near neutral and good, meaning it wasn't probably the most satisfactory arrival experience. Potentially negative. So from that, we can actually draw some very interesting conclusions. What we might conclude is that most international travelers arriving in South Africa from European countries with children have been adversely affected by the new immigration legislation. Now, the example we used with just four short questions was very simple. But if we had applied the larger set of questions, then we could have clearly made and drawn some interesting conclusions. So that's how we do it. That's how we take a simple problem, create a question out of it, assemble data, organize, code, and analyze it, and draw conclusions. So that's all the content for this week. Next week, we're going to, I'm going to take you through um, more examples and allow you more opportunities to actually do some analysis on your own. Before we go, just some reminders of upcoming events. In this case, assignment number two. In spite of the fact that we're not all together on campus, you should, by this point, have met, either in person or virtually, with your group. What I want to make sure is that you're at least communicating and that you're formulating a question, dividing responsibilities, and coming up with a plan to address the brief of assignment two. As a further reminder, please make sure that you've noted your group number and that you've been in touch with your group. That's all we have for this week. I do hope I get to see you in person soon, and I wish you all well.